Welcome to the meeting room at Global TV Talk Show, a broadcast service of globalbusinessnews.net. This episode from the meeting room of Global TV Talk Show is brought to you by The Bridge School, the accredited international online private school of choice at bridgek12.org. Porch Light Rental and Destination Services. Reduce your renter lump sum or managed relocation costs. Visit them at porchlightrental.com. Cube Monk, featuring the world's first smart cube. Track your goods with our advanced GPS system. Welcome to the future of moving and relocation at cubemonk.com. Primestone Partners, featuring corporate, government, and developer housing solutions, as well as senior level advisory services. Find them at primestonepartners.com. And by airs.com. With our full range of services, we can help design and manage your international relocation. Find us at airs.com. Insured Nomads provides protection and peace of mind with health insurance, travel insurance, group, or tailored insurance for the globally mobile. Visit us at insurednomads.com. And by International Auto Source. We are the vehicle experts for expats, featuring all major brands of automobiles with flexible solutions and financing. On the web at intlauto.com. Become a global player in your field. Cross Culture to Go provides virtual support for your global business and career success. We can help you thrive in 140 plus countries and markets. On the web at crossculturetogo.com. It's Ed Cohen in San Diego, and this is Global TV Talk Show, a business unit of globalbusinessnews.net. Globalbusinessnews.net. <laughs> Originally set up uh, online in 03 by uh, a guy, uh, uh, an old friend of mine who was at the time a developer at Intel up north. And uh, so he's the tech genius behind this thing, and I've uh, learned how to put pictures in place. So Google Analytics uh, says that since 03, we've had a little over 1.2 million reader page views from over 100 countries. Last year, according to their wisdom and their records, they say 75,000. And this year, January 1 through April 5, Google Analytics reported 20,207 reader page views, and it's mostly due to this global TV talk show. So thank you. Our special guest today is Stephen Howard, who's an author of 21 books on leadership and management expertise, and he also has uh, Caliente Press and Caliente Leadership Workshops. Paul Walker is an old friend as well, um, been, uh, has been retired as an active uh, C-suite executive in technology firms and has been a consultant to CEOs in the C-suite and boards for many years. Welcome again, Paul Walker. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome uh, John Platt, uh, who uh, is an old friend from Boston and uh, now in Coronado, California. And we, we were just together yesterday afternoon playing trivia. So <laughs> um, John uh, Platt uh, is a retired uh, executive very senior with the U.S. Postal Service. All right, let's go to Stephen Howard. Stephen, please explain to the audience our brainstorm about Strive XL and Thrive XL. All right, well, thanks, Ed. The uh, Strive XL, uh, which is the program we're on today, is talking about leadership and how leadership has changed in the post-COVID era. Uh, some of the things that we need to, skill, new skills we need as leaders to be leaders in this era, whether it's managing remote employees or just understand the empathy necessary, the kindness necessary to be a good leader in today's world. Uh, Thrive XL is going to be about leadership well-being and workplace wellness. And it's a, just really deep focus on the things leaders need to do to make sure our workplace environments are psychologically safe, mentally safe, healthily safe, uh, as well as taking care of themselves and be good role models. So that's what we'll be discussing in the Thrive XL programs. XL, I mean, quite simply, when we first 
had this concept. We thought about, you know, using the X like SpaceX and TEDx. And, and, uh, but then I thought, you know, really want people to live large. So we did XL. So we want people to live extra large and strive to do the best they can, strive to be the best leaders they can, and strive to be the best uh, human beings they can. So that's the basis of these programs. All right. That's great. Thank you very much for that deep dive. And we'll circle back, of course, and we encourage dialogue in between. Paul Walker and I did a talk show a couple of months ago, and he was just brilliant uh, explaining how he is like the CEO or the board whisperer (laughs) 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 and and how he takes care of these uh, uh, megalomaniacs and sometimes. No. Uh, so it's Paul, a tough job. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough job. So how do you manage that? Well, you know, the first thing I do generally is create rapport with them and have them see that I've done this before for 35 years. That helps. Drop a few names. And but then I say, look, I need to know how your team sees you. If I'm going to coach you, if I'm going to help you be a better leader. So I will have them write a letter to their direct reports that you know Paul Walker is working with us, and I would like you to be completely open with him about my leadership, about the strength of the team of leaders that we represent, and about the strategy of our business. And that's how I start, and it's very informal. I call them. Uh, I used to go there, but now I do it on Zoom. And uh, I really get to know. And and when I say to the CEO, because some of it's kind of shocking, right? (laughs) It's like, uh, I'll say that, look, look, Steve, let's say the guy's name is Steve. Um, This is what people think. It might not be true, okay? I'm not saying it's true. I'm just saying this, and this is an aggregate of the people who work for you, what they think. So we got to deal with that. We have to deal with what they think, whether it's right or wrong. Now we know, now we need to put a plan together to bring the team together under your leadership. So oftentimes it's all about uh, kindness and leadership, right? Our kindness and attitude to uh, a disparate bunch of people. It is. I had a, a client who I won't name, but he was president of a big, uh, large semiconductor company or division of a semiconductor company. I was the overall coach for all the presidents. And so we took him off site, you know, to do like a three day strategic planning thing. And, oh, I don't know. In the, in the middle of the first day, he said, I have to excuse myself. I have an earnings call. So I have to go and do the earnings call. And uh, in the back of my mind, I'm going, well, you could have planned that in advance, <laughs> but I didn't say that. <laughs> so I said, he said, just carry on with the team building. And I said, well, you know, we can't ha- do a team building without the leader in the room and you're the leader. So we'll just, we'll just take a pause. When you come back, we'll start. Okay. The minute he left the room, when was out of sight, the team attacked me. This is the most vicious, mean, uh, satirical leader. That, and they were in rebellion. There's a team of engineers. It was a big engineering company, semiconductors, and um, they were they were ready to go. They were they were ready to go. And the leader, uh, his roots are in Egypt, so he kind of led like a pharaoh. <laughs> so uh, I intercepted him before he came back in the room, and I told him, I said, "Look, your, your team is rebelling. They're, they're asking me to." do something about you, knowing that I report to the big CEO. And uh, this is why I had a little talk with him. And I said, you know, to get people to do things, you don't have to be nasty. You can do it in a kind way. You have the position power. And over time, you'll develop respect. Right now, you don't have it. So we we got two and a half days now for you to... uh, win back their respect now. They don't know I'm having this conversation with you and I'm not gonna mention it to them. So when you go in there, uh, we planned a little speech that he'd make and he made it. And then throughout the course of the 
retreat, you know, he, he was, he was being kind and gentle and you know, how, <laughs> later people said, what do you do to him? <laughs> and I said, well, nothing, you know, he, he just didn't realize his behaviors were upsetting you guys. So uh, this is why we do these offsites. Yeah. It was part of a bigger company and I went through all the five companies within the big company and did the same thing. And uh, so it was great. I mean, sometimes people are not being kind. They don't realize it. They're just habitually acting the way they act. And so you really have to listen and uh, give people chance to say what they really want to say instead of, you know, polish the apple. So Thank you, Paul. Stephen, um, would you comment on that, especially from the view of our, us doing this program? Yeah, I, I, I love a lovely story, Paul. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, and, you know, I see that often, particularly first time leaders. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a first time leader, you know, great individual contributor, you know, maybe technical expertise, uh, functional expertise, gets moved into a management position, supervisor position or a team leader position. And they suddenly think that they're the leader, therefore they're the boss and they become very directive. And so one of the things I do when I'm coaching them is say, look, you wear multiple hats, you're going to wear the individual contributor hat still, you're still going to have to do stuff yourself. You're also going to wear the leadership hat. And that means, you know, Paul mentioned listening. You got to listen. You got to coach. You've got to be more empathetic with it. And at times you're going to have to be a manager. A manager is more directive, gives direction. And, but you have to understand which hat you're wearing and be purposeful mm-hmm. in wearing that hat at that specific time. So uh, great story, Paul. Thanks for sharing. John Platt, would you like to comment on that? Well, I think one of the biggest, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the biggest things I've learned you know, and I, I view, uh, I'll tell you, every experience that I've had, I've always started out with saying, you view every experience as a learning vehicle. And you try to take away something from that. And, and one of the biggest things I took away very early in life was the, the, the ability, I guess, or the knack of listening. I became a better listener. And I listened to people talk and and. You can always uh, make some adjustments or do something with it, but you got to, it's like Paul said earlier, you got to know they were, they were quite angry and they were going to give it to them, but uh, you got to listen to what they're going to say and you got to hear what they're going to say. And then you got to put it all together and say, what makes up the pie here? What's going on? Mm -hmm. And and, uh, I found that to be very, very enlightening, at least for me anyway. And one of the biggest Biggest things that I've ever learned in, is as far as leadership and management go, I can give direction, I can give guidance, and I can give all of that. That's that's part of managing it, it, it too. But it's it's understanding, you know, where, where they're coming from, the people that are doing the job for you. Mm-hmm. That's what's important, was always important to me anyway. What are they doing? Why are they doing it? And what do they think they should be doing or need to be doing to be successful? Because the bottom line is, you know, we want success to breed success and we want to be successful in whatever we do. So, uh, you know, that that to me, that was a, a very important thing that I learned was listen to the people. And I, I sometimes I would walk down if I had an issue that I was dealing with. I would walk down to the pl- pl- platform like in, in Boston. I had a, a million square foot platform down there mm-hmm. and I'd go down there and I'd talk to a mail handler. And I'd say, you know, we're having a hell of a time here, you know, getting this through and doing this or doing this. And he says, well, of course you are, but you're not doing this. <laughs> and I'd say, oh, okay. And how would you do it then? What, 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 what are you making of this? And he said, well, this is the way I would do it. But we'll... So I took his ideas and n- not just him, but others, but and, and you, you, you put them together and then you put your ideas together with your ideas what your staff's ideas, and then you come up, you come up with a collaboration and, and you make it happen, you know, that way, but you've got the interest, you've got the people to buy in because they knew you were down there. They knew you were doing that. They knew you were talking to the people. You weren't just, you know, making a staff decision or a general management decision, whatever. And I, 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 I don't know. I, I found that to be another great, great tool that I, that I used a lot. 
So, um, thank you, John. That was insightful. Uh, Paul Johnston, let's show a couple of these things. Uh, you can start with uh, anyone you wish, and then we're going to discuss, and then we'll go to the next, and then the next. So, Stephen Howard, <laughs> tell us what you came up with on this. Well, Strive XL, as I said, we want to we want to strive to be leaders. Um, you know, extra large, so to speak, we can be the best leaders we can. And I think, I honestly believe that the better we become at leadership, the better we become at human beings. You know, the skills that everyone's talking about here today, you know, listening skills. If you, if you develop, I'm, I'm sure John was a great father, a great parent um, and, and husband, uh, you know, because those listening skills will parlay into the, into the personal life as well. Um, the, uh, the kind, you know, Paul's talking about kindness, anything we can do in the kindness in the workplace is going to just spill over into our personal life. And, and uh, it's amazing. Uh, you start seeing people holding the door for other people um, when they come in and out of a supermarket now. Uh, I think one thing that's come out of the pandemic, I think, is we've all learned to be nicer to each other a little bit. Uh, we're still a very diverse society and, and, uh, and divided pretty much down the line on most issues. But I do see a more occasions of people being nice to one another. So uh, I just, you know, my idea for this program to co-host with you, Ed, was to, you know, let's get these kind of conversations, engaging conversations that our listeners will, will be engaged with and hopefully we'll get, you know, audiences participating, asking questions. So let's just talk about some of the things that we can all do to become better leaders in today's world, Thank personally you. and professionally. Thanks. Okay, Paul Johnson, let's do another one. Now this, uh, Sorry for the uh, bombshell here, Stephen, <laughs> but, but <laughs> okay. I happen to love this thing you did. So why don't you tell us about what this is and how it relates to what we're talking about? Well, this relates to, um, you know, one of my key things I focus on is helping people learn how to make better decisions. And I, I think uh, one of my pet phrases is I want people to particularly leaders to learn to be first responders, not first reactors. And we all work in a 24 seven environment, even, even working from home, everything's fast paced. We tend to re react to everything. I mean, an email comes in and we react to it. And I'm coaching leaders to say, slow down, stop, pause, you know, think about it. What can you do differently? Um, you know, as, as John just said, walk down to the platform, walk out, you know, walk to your colleague or you know, when you're back to working from in the office or pick up the phone and talk to somebody first rather than, you know, I had a guy in uh, Orange County I'm coaching the other day. He talked about he had a uh, disagreement with his colleague up in Northern California, and, and he was about to fire off a nasty email. And I'm going, why are you going to do that? You've known this guy for 15 years. Uh, he's he's going to misinterpret it. Pick up the phone, call him, tell him this is how you feel about this issue. Deal with it one to one, because once you put it in writing, it can get forward to somebody else. So, you know, this is just Think differently. Think. Be creative in your approach to things. Be creative in your solutions to the way you think about making decisions. So that this is all about the brain. And and um, you know, one of my books is about how under stress and anxiety we make poor decisions, and and how stress and anxiety impacts our decision making. So that graphic on the screen now is all is kind of like about that. We need to learn how to make better decisions in the workplace and in our personal lives. Uh, let's go to Paul Walker. Uh, so Paul, in your book. Uh, about reimagining uh, and, uh, you know, what, why don't you talk about your book and the theme is, uh, I don't have it in front of me, but yeah. it's, all, it's all about reinventing. Yeah, it's called Invent Your Future, starting with your calling, right? And of course, a leader's job is to invent his or her future, the future of the team and the future of the company. And so people say, well, what do you mean by their calling? Well, personally, as a leader, we all have skills, natural gifts, and we all have a lot of things we do that are not naturally our gifts, and they are done only fairly. But when you can build your leadership around what your natural gifts are, I call that your calling, then you're gonna be much more successful. You're just gonna be yourself and lead the company. Now, when it comes to the marketplace, the same is true. Sometimes leaders decide this is what they want to do, and they're not listening to the marketplace. They're not listening to what the marketplace is calling for. And here, hence, you know, it's an aggravated uphill climb. <coughs> Half the people on the team can see we're going in the wrong direction, but the leader is so stuck on that direction, they won't tell him. 
So um, it's, I interviewed 25 successful leaders for the book and I kind of aggregated their advice. And uh, it, it's a good one because it's not just me, but it's these other leaders talking like the CEO of California Pizza Kitchen and so on. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Paul Johnson, if we could, if you could uh, find uh, the front cover to Paul's Walker's book, it'll be great. If not, oh, maybe you got it already. There it is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, look at that. Four and a half what? stars. Great. Okay, Stephen, uh, what do you think about all this? I, you know, I got a big question for Paul because I, I love the thing, Invent Your Future. Um, in fact, I'll have to pick that book up and read it now. Uh, so, thanks for that, Paul. Um, the... Um, but Paul, I'd like to ask you a question, if I could. Um, how do you, how can you teach someone to be kinder? I mean, like this story, but following up on your story earlier, what how, what's your approach to teaching people to be kinder as leaders? Okay. Well, once I get to know them, I have the assumption, and I think it's true, that people are doing the best they know how, given their life circumstances and history. Mm -hmm. And... It is just true, not necessarily the best they can do, right? But the best they know how. Even maybe the next morning they go, geez, oh, why did I say that, right? Yeah. You know, so that's one of the first things I say to my leaders, you know, because usually when I talk to them, they give me a list, here, we got to work on this guy, we got to work on this guy, you know, you've heard the story. And then, and then and I say, well, let's start with this assumption that everyone's doing the best they know how. And you too, right? You, you're not perfect, are you? Because if you were, you probably wouldn't be hiring me, right? <laughs> no, no, I'm not. But you don't come into work, you know, with the purpose of saying something nasty or angering the entire team. No, because, you know, one of the things I'll say to them, ever try to inspire a team that is uh, angry at you and angry at the situation they're in, it's, it's not going to work very well. So you have to get the team listening to each other, treating each other with respect, and then you'll be a team. You've got to get to know each other. Right. We all have strengths and weaknesses. Nobody's perfect. So you want to be able to know, okay, in this situation, George is perfect because he's really good at this. Okay, we're looking at uh, Paul's uh, LinkedIn page. A lot of stuff there. Um, so on the bottom right there, it says something like release your stress, Paul. Uh, okay. that, that relates to what? Your self talking to yourself, right? Yeah. Well, like I said earlier, leadership is a very difficult and stressful job. I mean, every leader I've worked with, whether they admit it or not, is under a lot of stress. And so I help them with some techniques to quiet their mind and release their stress to look into what's stressing them, understanding themselves, why it's stressing them. And I, I just work them through it until they go, oh, I see, you know, the light goes off. And I never blame them for, I'm, I'm a kind person anyway, and it probably doesn't pay off to blame your client for his or her behavior right off the bat. And, uh, but I don't. They're trying the best they can. It's a tough job. I've been a leader in a consulting firm that we built. I used to be a turnaround expert for a couple of big conglomerates. And uh, everyone's trying to do the best they know how. Yeah. Well, someday you're going to have that Genius Stone Center open again. And I'll, I want to come and visit. <laughs> yes. No, it won't be long. I've had all my shots. So. <laughs> Me real. too. If you all Me your shots, you can come yeah. over. Me too. Yeah. Yes. All right. Good. All right. Paul Johnston, if you could um, pick the black swan or some other thing to show. Wow. So here we are. Uh, we've been through it. So uh steven oh uh, so uh, this is an image i purchased the rights to uh from getty um so 
don't worry about this. <laughs> uh, so, so Stephen, uh, here we have, a, of course, a, a swan on, on a lake and glamorized uh, for this purpose. Um, so we've been through black swans and you too. So uh, the COVID has done a number on businesses, particularly in hospitality and travel and the relocation business. And uh, how do you deal with this? I mean, how should we have dealt with it? Or maybe how can we change ourselves? Like Paul Walker said, reinvent ourselves going forward. I think that's that's been part of it. There's, I guess there's two things. One is to be agile and flexible. And, and, and you know, a year ago, you know, unfortunately several of our le- political leaders and even institutional leaders were talking about this will be a, a three week to three month type event. And, you know, here we are, I think in month 13 or 14 or something. So I think fortunately some of the smaller people running smaller business were more flexible, more agile. I mean, I, I sat down with my, uh, my girlfriend and, and uh, when we got first got quarantined and said, well, what are we going to do? What can we do? And so in the last year, she's written and produced three books. I wrote and produced two books. Uh, we, she's created her own blog site. So there's a lot of things you can do individually. Now we make a lot of money, no, but we're keeping our head above water. But I think also organizations have, have learned to be flexible and agile. And in fact, I'd, I'd like John to pitch in a little bit. Yeah, that's one of her books right there. When strong women speak, strong women listen. But you know, John, if you were still at the post office, what would come, what would be some of the things you might be looking at today to you know bring the post? And a lot of the postal workers obviously still continue to work as essential workers. But what could you do to make sure that they felt? Um, part included what would you do to make sure they felt uh, uh safe uh, coming back to work and what what thoughts you have in mind if you were still there or for any other company well i guess the first thing i would say is i would lead by example and that that being i would you know portray a, a safe environment myself and and tell them what i expect them to do but i, I would also make it i wouldn't just say words i would make it happen because I think that people see things happen or hear things happen. And if you, all they do is hear things happen, then they're going to worry about whether their environment is actually safe or not. And I, I believe that that, that that goes a long way, Stephen, to, to promoting you know, uh, the goodwill, if you want to call it that, for people coming back to work. Mm. You want people to come back to work with enthusiasm, with the same creativity, as you called it, you know, that, that, you know, they had before they left and they, you don't want them to be afraid. Don't be afraid of the work. The work is going to be here. The work we're going to take care of and the work we're going to make safe for you. So I, I think that, that a lot of that has to do with, you know, my telling them and showing them, you know, what, what, you know, this environment is going to be like when they come back to work. And, and I don't want them to be afraid to come back to work. Good. And I want to come back. I want them to come back with that same enthusiasm of making it successful. Because the bottom line to me, you know, is, is I always believe that if you're going to operate a, a, a large operation, a big operation, you want to make your operation successful. And you, you got to do it, you know, it's like the old elephant, one bite at a time. Mm. And, and you take it and, you, and you, you move it and you move it and you move it. And why are you doing it? You're building that trust you know, in people that they see what you're doing. Because the one thing a lot of leaders forget about is when they do something, you know, they think, ah, well, nobody will see that. Nobody will know about mm-hmm. that. Well, guess what, guys? Everybody knows about it. Yeah. <laughs> they all know about it and they know what you're doing. So what you got to do is you got to make them, you got to show them that you're talking the talk, you know, and you're walking the walk. And, 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 and that's important, especially in the safety and health area. My gosh, with, with what we would just went through in the last, you know, 14 months, as you said, it's, it's been absolutely fantastic. It's phenomenal. I, I, I still have a hard time comprehending the whole thing myself mm-hmm. because I, I, I've never experienced anything like this before. And, and um, I don't know if anybody has actually, but it's, uh, I believe that you got to do what you got to do and you got to show it. You, yeah. you know, what you believe <clears throat> you're, what you're going to do for your company to make your company successful and make them successful and make them safe.
Something that's really neat is that the Bridge School partners with various organizations to provide learning for their students. For example, we partner with a major ballet company and we are able to enroll several of their students into our school. So now not only is the student able to participate in a school and have a seamless transition while they're very active in their ballet career, but now they have um, other dancers that are with them that are doing some of the same courses. So it's almost becoming a, a camaraderie where they're taking similar courses, they're working together on their ballet, and really being able to form this great partnership with these organizations to provide a needed service. A lot of times um, there are student athletes who will spend hours and hours at the gym or um, at the, the basketball courts, wherever it is. And if they're attending a traditional school, they're in school from eight to three. They get a quick snack and then they're at the gym for three to four hours in the evening. Coming to us and having that partnership, they're able to break that up throughout the day. They can have a morning practice, get some schooling in, have an afternoon practice, finish their schooling in the evening. So there's that flexibility. And additionally, if there are tournaments or performances, it's fantastic because if there's a week where they have shows straight through, they can take that week off of learning and then pick back up when they're done. So it offers this great flexibility. And for the program owners of these sports leagues, it is a win-win situation for them because they see this need. They see this need that their students need to make sure that they are obtaining the grades necessary to be successful adults in, in our country and in other countries. But it provides them an environment where they can be successful at both. So John Platt, um, by example, you're, you're also telling them of what the vision is and the strategy, but now you want to what, bring the execution, if you will, uh, probably a bad word, but the implementation down to the lowest possible level, right? And empower that person to get behind it and <laughs> to be a leader. Is this Whistling Dixie, Paul Walker? Absolutely not. We, we <laughs> used to call it shadow of the leader. And uh, we would uh, I'd sit down with a CEO and say, OK, tell me all the things that you like about your team and all the things you dislike about your team. And this is after I got to know him really well. I'd, I'd done the interviews I mentioned. And I'd have him write it down. And I say, well, how many of the things that you like about your team are a shadow of your behavior, how you're acting? And they go, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I turn to the other list of things you don't like about the team. How many of those are a shadow of your behavior, your not so good traits? And they go, yeah. Yeah, well, it's a tough job. I say, yeah, it's a tough <laughs> job, but you've got to manage your leadership, what you do is more important than what you say, right? People watch you, you know, and yeah. uh, so, and you can see by the interviews you just did, a lot of the things they don't like about you fit on this list you just gave me. So just be careful what you say, be kind. It doesn't mean, you know, so how can I be kind when somebody's not doing their job? Easy. You know, there's two ways to do it. You know, you're a fool and you're not doing your job and I'm going to fire you. Uh, it's not going to have a long lasting effect. They're, they're going to avoid you. They're going to stop talking to you. They're going to hide. You can be kind. You, can, you know, you can say, look, I know that some of these things that you've been doing have been irritating some of your employees, some of our employees. Are, are you aware that you're irritating the employees? Are you aware of this? And they usually say, well, no. I say, well, you are, and here's, here's how it works, and here's what they're saying. Um, I had one guy, he was an ex-drill instructor, instructor in the Marines, and he was running a big part of this company. 
and he never he never had anybody do push-ups, but it came close. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And I said, look, you know, this is not the Marines. People can leave. You know, they haven't signed up for five years and people will leave. That's why you're bringing me in in the first place. So right. what you do speaks louder than what you say. And when what you do and what you say are the same, that's when you get respect. That's when people see you as a real. Yeah. So, yeah. so Stephen, does, this fits right into your vision. Of it does. Yeah, uh, and in and, and particular right now, it's going to be so important that leaders understand that people are going to see, watch what they do. So, for instance, I mean, if you, if you have a policy, let's say you're in an office building and you're you're trying to do social distancing of six feet or, you know, um, whatever, and four people in an elevator and you're even, I don't care if you're the CEO, if, you, if the elevator comes to your floor and there's already four people in it, you need to wait. You can't just say, oh, I gotta, I gotta run to a meeting. I can jump in the elevator if you want everyone else to follow the four people per elevator rule, if that happens to be your rule. So, uh, you know, I saw a funny, a great photograph the other day. I mean, where I live, a Cathedral City nearby, they uh, launched a great project of a, a, a complex homes for veterans. And they did the groundbreaking ceremony. They had the five people, I think from the city council or something, all with their shovels out there digging dirt, not a single one of them wearing a mask. And, you know, they were three, you know, three feet apart, almost shoulder to shoulder for their photo op. But you know what? How are you going to tell the residents of Cathedral City to go out and wear masks in public when your leaders aren't doing it? So I think now more than ever, people, as Paul just said, are going to watch what leaders are doing. And I think that's the old thing of, well, I'm the leader. I can those rules don't apply to me. Uh, I don't think that rule applies anymore, quite frankly. No, they more, apply to you more than anybody because of your influence on the whole company. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. John? Paul Johnston, do we have any uh, slides remaining? Oh, there we go. All right, Stephen, tell us what we're looking at. Well, who's that handsome fella? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice beard. Thank you. Thank you. That was uh, my pre Christmas look, I think. Um, but yeah, this is my LinkedIn page. So, uh, you know, look, my focus is, you know, as it says there, I, my focus is turning good managers into great leaders. And I try and help people, you know, you can be a really good manager. I mean, I'm sure that gentleman who was ex drill and sergeant was a great manager. Um, I'm sure Paul helped turn him into a better leader. And that's, that's my focus. I try and turn good managers into great leaders by focusing on some of the things we talk about, listening skills, empathy, uh, communications. And so uh, Caliente Leadership is my company. Um, the reason for that, those you know Spanish, you know that Caliente means hot in Spanish. But it, the second definition is passionate. So a conversation, Caliente is a passionate conversation. Mm -hmm. And I'm very passionate about leadership. And also uh, where I live in, in Palm Springs, the land is owned by the Agua Caliente Band of Indians. So it's a little bit of my tribute to our Native American landowners as well. So Caliente leadership is uh, how to contact me. Right. Now, uh, about your relocation, if I can ask, uh, into a foreign country, uh, in, into Mexico City, um, uh, I wish you well. And we're gonna, definitely I'm going to come and visit. Well, I hope <laughs> but, so. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So we we have produced our meetings, our live meetings in the past, uh, in uh, Palenco, uh, in the shopping center there. There's a uh, Ernst and Young headquarters, mm -hmm. and so they were our host partner a couple of years in in doing meetings there. And AIG was the the big insurance company at the time was interested in what I was doing. Uh, so they were a big sponsor. And then Bruce and Young and AIG and some other locals all came together. We had over 200 people in that room. Uh, and uh, that was now th probably three years ago. Mm -hmm. And so would love to come back, of course. But uh, the type of leadership, let's talk about post-COVID leadership uh, in a, a service company like Ernst & Young or, or uh, AIG huge companies, highly structured. Um, they, they already said they're not going to have, what, 60% of the hmm. desks taken, and they don't know what they're going to do with all that real estate. <laughs> so, I mean, this is a, the hell of a management problem now. Um, so what do you think of all that? 
Is that aimed at me or somebody else? Oh, uh, Stephen Howard. Oh, okay. Put, put you me. on the spot. <laughs> put yeah. me on the spot. I, I think, I mean, I think that's one of the critical skills for leaders going forward in addition to kindness and empathy is learning how to lead remote workers. Um, you know, one of the things I coach people on right now, I said, when you get on a call with, with one of your direct reports, I ask them, what's the first question they, you ask them? And they typically say something about a job project or something. I said, no, the first question you should always ask is how's the family doing? Not even how the worker is doing. How is the family coping? How are the kids coping? And then the second question is, how are you coping? And, then, and don't just let them get away with, oh, I'm fine and wave it off. That's why, you know, Zoom calls are good because you can see the body language. And, you know, it, understand if someone's not, if someone's stressed, someone's not doing well, then that is a leader. That's your responsibility to help them through that, help them through the angst and the stress. And, yeah. and I had one of the guys I coached, very just quick story. One of the guys I coached, uh, we used to uh, have a uh, four o'clock in the afternoon or sorry, no, sorry. Other way we used to have 10 o'clock AM phone calls on like Wednesday or Thursday morning for our coaching call. And one day he seemed very stressed. I said, what's wrong? He said, I'm, I'm really afraid of my bandwidth. I, both my girls are on school from home and my wife's working from home and there's now four of us on the internet. So if I drop off, please excuse. And I said, well, are, are you worried about the girls in school? He said, yeah, no one, neither one of us has time to monitor them right now. I said, would you rather we do this call this afternoon? He said, that would be even wonderful. I said, how about in the future? How about, I said, should we change all our phone calls to four o'clock, you know, in the afternoon? He said, that would be very helpful. And it's that flexibility that being an agile, but it's more important is understanding what that person's situation is and adapting to it as a leader, or in my case, as, as their coach. That's a wonderful thing. John Platt, would you agree? I agree. I would agree wholeheartedly, as a matter of fact. You know, I think it's so important that, that you, 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 you interact well with your people, but that you, you get to the basics and remember what their basics are. Mm. You know, sometimes, as Steve said, it's not always, you know, what's your project doing or whatever. It's how are you? Yeah. How is your family? You know, and how you coping with this whole situation here? They they coming through it all right. So I agree. Yeah, Paul Johnson. I think we've done all the slides. So thank you very much. If there's one kicking around, then throw it up there. But uh, Paul Paul Walker, you you've heard a, a you probably heard all this stuff before <laughs> uh, in in your other meetings. You know, over the recent history. Um, so what do you see as the biggest issue? for companies in Southern California and LA Metro in particular, um, that uh, are dealing with such a huge diverse population. Yeah. I mean, how, how uh, this is not political, but it's certainly business oh. and, and communications and uh, with, with such, such rage out there in the workplace, uh, in the population, how do you manage a business this, in this era? Well, I think it, one thing that's really important is, is that you understand the different cultural dynamics that exist in your company. You have the Hispanics, and you, you know, it's so diverse. Uh, you really need to understand their cultures because, you know, I'm originally from England and believe me, it took me uh, through elementary school to understand the American culture, and I suffered a lot because of that. You know, I had a proper British accent, which you can't hear anymore. But understand people, understand what they're going through. Where does the rage come from? Ask them, don't be afraid, right? Well, I'm not angry, you know. And I said, well, tell your face, you know, because. <laughs> You know, I could be, I could be mistaken, but you seem, and just, and use humor. Don't, you know, don't be a shrink for God's sakes, right? Go in there and talk to them, get them to laugh, get them to see and release their rage. And tell me, what are you so upset about? You know, and, and this is a private conversation. It's not going anywhere. I'm just here to help you. I think you'll feel a lot better if you can express how you feel uh, rather than taking it out on your employees, you know, sit down with me because it's a tough job you've got here. Yeah. And, and the things are not really pleasant out there. Thank you. John Platt, you've well, seen some of this. I, I have. And, and I guess that I, I, I go back to uh, 
the very first day, uh, first week rather, that I came out here to California and I had a meeting with about uh, 350 of my managers and they were, they're were all full of, you know, trepidation and uh, what's he like, what's he going to do, what's he going to change, what's he going to do. So I got up there and the first thing I said to him, uh, I said, now I want everybody to understand the reason I was sent out here is because I'm out coming out here to teach you all the King's English. <laughs> in a Boston accent, right? <laughs> yeah, my, 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 my Boston, you know, English. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you something. Uh, not only did, did I get a, a, an ovation for that one, but that had come up probably eight or ten times in the subsequent years. People have remembered, you know, that I said that. And, and that was like an icebreaker for everybody. It just calmed the whole room down from where they were sitting. They were so tense and so worried about what I was going to do and how I was going to do it. And the other thing they, they worried about was that I was going to, because they weren't doing well, by the way, when I came out, that I was going to bring a lot of people out from the East Coast. Mm. And, and you know, just infiltrate them. With, with, oh, so, so you're talking about they were fearful of what's now called today the replacement yeah, worry. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 be, and because, remember, the bottom line is that if you're doing well, you're not as fearful as of, of a replacement. But we weren't, they weren't doing well. And so I, I very bluntly said to them in the same meeting, by the way, you know, after that question came up, I said, listen, you guys built this situation you have right here now. I said, my job is to unbuild that situation and make it successful with you. And I said, I got to do it with you and not without you. And I'm not going to bring in a lot of people to do that. I'm going to do it with you. And we're going to all be successful. And, and uh, I got to tell you, I got another roaring ovation because of that. Uh, and and uh, I don't know if I'd get it today, but I, I did then. So I, I think that, uh, I think, that plays a major role with how you approach them and, and how you talk to them. And, and, and I always go back to the old days. My little old aunt used to say, you know, remember one thing as you go through life, it's nice to be nice. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the things I've never forgotten. And, and I treat people, I try to treat people with respect. Okay. You know, not, not only to understand them, but to treat them with a little bit of respect too. Because they are, the, you've got a diverse diverse workforce out there so we've got, we've got five minutes remaining thank you john platt i thought that was brilliant uh stephen howard um is this sounds to me like we're off to a good start with this product this is a wonderful conversation i mean i, I said the word engaging conversation i can't imagine a more engaging conversation between four people at one time around around this topic and and i just love the way everyone's echoing each other's thoughts and uh, i'm going to do a quick echo here of what john said when when i joined citibank in singapore i was an american hired by an american expatriate i, I was already living in singapore i had was going to be put in charge of 23 people all Singaporeans, which meant 80% of them were Chinese, a couple of Malaysian, a couple of Thais or Indians as well. So the cultural differences were huge. And, um, and I, I realized that the, I had a big gap to close. And so in my initial talk to them, I don't want to call it a speech to my new conversation with the whole team. I said, look, I know I'm, I'm new. Uh, and I know you have concerns about that and you worry about whether I'm going to fit in two things. One, I've already lived in Singapore uh, eight years at that time. So I understood the Singapore culture. And I second, I said, our boss, the guy who hired me, you all respect. You have a great deal of respect for him. I know you do. I know you trust him. So I'm going to ask you just trust his judgment that he's brought the right person in. And as far as I'm concerned, this is a team. It's all about we. It's not about me. So I think that, that helped cross that cultural divide tremendously. So. so I want to go a little bit deeper, if you don't mind, Stephen. Uh, you also told me at one time you were with uh, you're an executive in marketing with Time, Time Life, Time Magazine. Right. OK, so. Um, totally different than banking, mm -hmm. but people are the same anywhere. Yeah. People are the same, although they are, they're all unique. They're all different, I think. And that's, again, one of the mistakes people make is when they lead a team, whether it's six people or 
20 people or John just told about 300 managers. Like I can't imagine having 300 managers underneath me, but um, uh, 23 was <laughs> kind of stretch my capabilities, I think. But, but yeah, but you have to lead them individually, uniquely. I mean, um, some people need direction. Some people need coaching. Some people need a, a, a shoulder to cry on. Some people need a kick in the butt sometimes. And, and as a leader, one of the, you have to understand the differences of, of your people and, and treat them with kindness, as John said, uh, and, and Paul as well. Uh, treat them with respect. Uh, and I think the best way to treat them with respect is by listening to them at all times. Um, and I know many of the mistakes I made as a leader was when I didn't listen, when I cut people off or I assumed I knew what they what they were going to say or I didn't have time. I mean, the worst thing, I think the worst thing I ever said to somebody one time was, I don't have time right now. I'm running to a meeting. And it was a weekly status meeting. And this person had something major on their goal. And I wish I had stopped and said, you know what? Your situation is more important than this meeting. Um, Paul, could you go to the meeting for me? And I should have stopped. And I did, but I learned. I, I, I think John said earlier, every, every experience is a learning experience. And I got better because I learned from my mistakes. I learned from the mistakes of others. So important to see you're willing to learn as a leader. I mean, it's such a powerful position to come from. Mm -hmm. It is. You know, to, yeah, Paul, today I still read 50 articles on leadership every month. I probably read six to eight books on leadership a year. Uh, and I publish a list every month to my contact list. Here are the articles I've read here. Here's a link to them, whether they're on Forbes or Fast Company or Inc. or whatever. I, I, I still, you know, we're all learning right now. I mean, the world is so different than what it was 14 months ago or, you know, 28 months ago. Uh, we all have to learn right now to do things differently and learn to be better leaders. Yeah, I'm mean, working with a young 21-year-old entrepreneur who has raised $400,000 to build his AI business. And, there you go. And I'm 73, so had to learn to deal with his culture and how he does things. <laughs> and so how are you at text messaging now, Paul, and, and, and WhatsApp phone calls? I have him put the screen up. <laughs> All the stuff that I can use, and he can. Use. Yeah. 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 Gotta learn. Yeah, we we did a team building in Asia, Korea, China, Hong Kong, Singapore, and we tried to get the Japanese to join, but the others didn't want anything to do with the Japanese. No, even today. <laughs> so, Sometimes it's like that. We hold a grudge, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is great. Oh, here we go. This is a good one, Paul. Two ways to avoid listening. <laughs> Do talking and be too busy. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. So I. Um, want you all to come back. Uh, we'll send uh, a message out, of course, about Thrive and the next Strive, as well as the other programs that we're working on. Um, so uh, Stephen Howard, thank you very much for getting me involved with you. And Paul Walker, please come back again. And, right. and John Platt, uh, your insight uh, is just terrific. And I have to say to you, you manage and run these things so well. You do just such a great job. Thank you. Uh, I. I find that uh, I love this. Yeah. There's, no, there's no stress. But the reason for that, I have learned and continually learn, <laughs> is to get up early <laughs> and prepare. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Not only today, but, you know, you think about it every day, because every day this shows that I'm doing and everything is different. And uh, But it's in the prep. And getting people like you guys, frankly, if you did, you did your homework well, you sent me ideas of what you wanted to talk about or what, you know, is it relevant? And that's enough. Uh, and then I take it from there and then I can plan time. I'm watching the clock. Uh, and uh, we want to continue this C-suite, C-level okay. approach to things. Uh, I got plenty of other programs in which we're dealing on operational levels, um, but not this one. We have to keep this one at this level. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for being on Global TV Talk Show. Thank I've you. learned a lot. Yeah.
Thank you. Thank you. Ciao, bye. ciao. Bye bye. Bye bye. See you soon. Thank you for joining us in the meeting room at Global TV Talk Show. Have a wonderful day and stay safe.